I'll begin tonight with a poem. It's actually a piece of prose from Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. The late, great Kurt Vonnegut. God made mud, and God got lonesome. So God said to some of the mud, sit up. <laughs> See all I've made, said God, the hills, the sea, the sky, the stars. And I was some of the mud that got to sit up and look around. Lucky me, lucky mud. I, mud, sat up and saw what a nice job God had done. Nice going, God, I said. Nobody but you could have done it. I certainly couldn't have. I feel very unimportant compared to you. The only way I can feel the least bit important is to think of all the mud that didn't even get to sit up and look around. I got so much, and most mud got so little. Today, in the interviews and uh, talking to some of you, there was an expression of gratitude, of a deep feeling of, of appreciation for being here. And it's really a wonderful feeling uh, to have been given this gift, to have found this jewel of mindfulness and to be sitting here and letting your mind settle some and investigating who you are, investigating how your reality is created. It's such a special thing to be doing. I'm convinced it's an evolutionary leap that we're making when we come here to do this. And it's not so much that we find out anything in the form of knowledge, the way we usually think of finding out something, learning something. I often thought that, you know, if I ever got the answer, it would come in the form of a thought and there would be, you know, big capital letters, this is what it's all about. I don't think I've gotten that kind of knowledge from meditation, but it has led me towards the mystery. It has gotten me in touch with the wonder of what is going on here that none of us knows really anything about, truly. Do you know why we're here? why we have these minds, why we're sitting here playing with them and trying to figure it all out. and How did it happen? What if, I mean, if you look around, what, what if you'd never seen this before? All these little pieces of matter that kind of move around and they have this little knob here on top and they put dead plants and animals in this end, and <laughs> they, have, they have these things that come out the sides, and, and they come in, they sit, and they walk around, and nobody really knows. I, I am very grateful to my Dharma practice for bringing me into a, a state of wonder and and mystery. We usually I, I go through life, and, and I was like this, and I'm still like this quite often, taking everything for granted as if it's just the most ordinary thing to be alive. And uh, there's a kind of deadness in that. It's, it's what, what, what you see in the world when you're looking from that small self that's projecting all of its likes and dislikes and judgments on the world, and you're never really present 
for what it is, what it has to offer you when you are still and seeing with what we call beginner's mind. Beginner's mind, you don't know anything. And then it can open up into this field of wonder. Einstein said there are two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. And the other way is, 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 is as if everything is a miracle. Sometimes I know it's not easy. I, I have struggled my whole life with a kind of dark, cynical attitude. I consider myself now a cynic in recovery. <laughs> That's not to say that there aren't some reasons for cynicism. Politics, religion, civilization, I mean... <laughs> But I think that sometimes we, we get so caught in that drama of time and, you know, history and, uh, that we, we forget. And really, in some way, wonder and appreciation and awe are the cure for our ills. If we live with that kind of satisfaction of the mystery, having the mystery at hand, we won't need to rearrange the world to satisfy ourselves, we'll be walking around with astonishment and delight at, at this strange life we're inhabiting. There are two classical or traditional appreciations that are aroused. Uh, one is an appreciation for being born a human in this life. Because as a human, we can understand ourselves a little bit and we can see that we are not isolate, separate little monads moving through the world, but that we are co-arising with all things, that we co-arise with an atmosphere and with a planet and with other beings. And, and we understand our origins to some degree. And we can sit and look through the membranes of self and be liberated from that confining, constricting view or that feeling of being separate. Another appreciation is the appreciation for being born at a time when the Buddha's teachings are available so that we have the, the techniques and the understanding and the, the ways to, to do this, to explore. I also arouse appreciation for being born at a time of the scientific revolution, which is really the Western wisdom tradition, which is giving us a whole new understanding of who we are in the scheme of things. A lot of information and revelations that are very supportive of the Buddha's teaching. The scientific revolution is just the last couple hundred years really, that we've learned so many new things about ourselves. So tonight I'd, I'd like to lead you on a little reflection, and I think that reflection is often overlooked in our Dharma life, that, you know, we, we're so focused on meditation and getting rid of any kind of thinking and thought and coming into a totally uh, different way of understanding, which is wonderful and, and absolutely needs to happen. But we don't want to just throw reflection out, because reflection can really invigorate both our uh, desire to investigate and our sense of wonder, our sense of uh, the reality of what's happening, wise understanding that we really can reflect on impermanence or no self. And we can understand it in many ways, and I think, in, I think the story of evolution is a wonderful lesson in no self. It's taken 13.7 billion years to make you.
Okay, so you're not perfect yet. But 13.7 billion years to make you. Doesn't that kind of give you a sense of, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is a pretty amazing being. Einstein again. One cannot help but be in awe when one contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, or the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. Never lose a holy curiosity. So this is an exercise in arousing your holy curiosity. Uh, and I will be calling on uh, scientific information to help us in this. I call this exercise, Be Here, Wow. <laughs> and uh, I'm working on uh, developing a new Brahma Vihara, a new divine abode of awe. And uh, once, once I establish it firmly, then I will go down in history as a great spiritual adept who developed the first new divine abode since the Buddha's time. Yeah. <laughs> I want to start with a, um, a real Dharma lesson, a science and Dharma lesson, that I just find wonderful, partly because of the subject, which is a Nietzsche, impermanence. And impermanence is so key in the Buddha's teaching, because if we see the radical impermanence of things, we also see dukkha, because nothing is ultimately satisfying. There's no place to land and rest and hold. And Duke, uh, Anicca is also a key to anatta, because there, with everything in process, there is no abiding self to anything, no abiding self-nature to anything. So the Buddha understood radical impermanence. He talked about things changing millions of times in the blink of an eye. I often wonder, how did he understand that without an atom-smashing machine and laser photography? <laughs> he must have slowed his mind down slow enough so he could count how many times things changed in the blink of an eye. But now, I mean... The scientists, the physicists, talk about impermanence on a whole other level. An impermanence uh, so impermanent it makes our ordinary reality seem frozen in time. Way down inside of everything, where the quarks are doing a line dance inside of an electron, events are occurring in increments far shorter than the blink of an eye which is considered, by the way, to be one-tenth of a second. In the subatomic world, things are measured in what scientists call attoseconds, which is a millionth of a trillionth of a second. It takes an electron about an attosecond to travel all the way around a proton. But that's not all. Inside the proton, perhaps another level deeper into reality, an attosecond would be regarded as a long nap. Inside, way down inside, time is measured in zeptoseconds, a billionth of a trillionth of a second. Zeptosecond. Now, I think at some point the physicists realized that they were actually in a Marx Brothers routine of some kind, <laughs> where the jokes are coming so fast that you realize it's all a joke. So when they started to measure things changing even faster, in trillionths of a trillionth of a second, they named it a yoctosecond. <laughs> Atto, zepto, and yocto. <laughs> Hello, I must be going, right? It's a, <laughs> the time it takes for a quark to go around a proton is somewhere between a zepto and a yoctosecond. All you can do really is smile and let go, you know?
Then there are the astrophysicists who have given us a picture of a universe that uh, we once thought we were the center of. We once thought we were the whole thing, the whole reason for it all. But now it's so, they've discovered that it's so big for us to impute that we are the center of and the purpose of it all seems a real stretch. <laughs> in the mid-90s, I, I read in the paper, somewhere in the mid-section of the paper, not near the front page, but the Hubble telescope had been sending back pictures of, of the, the cosmos. And it had taken a picture of just a quarter-sized piece of the sky, just a little shot, and had found a uh, hundred new galaxies. Hundred, oh, I'm sorry, a hundred million new galaxies. Not solar systems, galaxies, each of them full of billions of suns many times larger than our sun, some of them millions of times larger than our sun. There are uncountable numbers of galaxies out there. Now, what's the message? Of course, it's that, you know, I guess we're not all that significant after all. Or <laughs> you could also see it as, wow, I am part of that. I am part of that hugeness, that big, as John calls it, the big. That's the humongous. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the astrophysicists say it all came from the explosion of a tiny dot smaller than an atom, the Big Bang. It, when the Big Bang happened, there was nothing there, basically, a, a little singularity, they call it. And everything came out of that. 13.7 billion years ago today. <laughs> Why not? Let's make this everybody's birthday. And in some sense, we're still, we're still, the Big Bang is still going on, and everything is the energy, everything we see around us, everything is using the energy of the Big Bang. That's where it all came from, all this light, all this, this fire, all this energy. When you take a step, when you move your hand, that's the energy of the Big Bang expressing itself. Right now inside your head, millions of synapses are firing, we hope. <laughs> or maybe you've, you know, you've chilled out so much, you know, there's only a few tens of thousands. Uh, but that, those synapses firing is the energy of the Big Bang trying to comprehend the Big Bang. We're pieces of the universe wondering about itself. How strange. The astrophysicists say there may be, uh, actually the astrophysicists and the mathematicians, because a lot of this goes on in people's heads. <laughs> it may not actually exist out there, uh, that there are many other universes. And in some Buddhist cultures, there it's, it's just assumed that this is just one universe. Uh, the Dalai Lama was once asked if they had the Big Bang in Tibetan Buddhist cosmology. And he said, mm, oh, yes, but bang, 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 many bangs. <laughs> In the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Buddha tries to explain how many worlds are known to him. He begins calculating, and uh, it goes on for several full pages. The final summation, it reaches a number 35 digits long. 
And then it goes on to say that 35-digit number squared <laughs> is an incalculable. An incalculable to the fourth power is a boundless. A boundless to the fourth power is an incomparable. An incomparable to the fourth power is an innumerable. An innumerable to the fourth power is an unaccountable. An unaccountable to the fourth power is an unthinkable. An unthinkable to the fourth power is an immeasurable. An immeasurable to the fourth power is an unspeakable. An unspeakable to the fourth power is an untold, which is unspeakably untold. And an untold multiplied by itself is a square untold. That's how many worlds are known to a Buddha mind. <laughs> really, we're so limited when we put on these self-blinders, you know. We get so limited in how we perceive or what we, can, what we imagine. One scientist said, the world is stranger. Reality is stranger than we imagine. And not only that, it's stranger than we can imagine. Okay, I'd like you to close your eyes for a minute. You don't have to get into the position. <laughs> Just close your eyes. Feel yourself seated here. Feel the truth of the fact that you are riding on this rock, this big rock, and you are hurling through space. First of all, you're traveling at uh, about 66,000 miles an hour ar around the Earth's axis, so spinning around, which is, pr you know, maybe why we, we're, we're so dizzy as a, as a species and bump into each other and create news and wars. And Anyway, and we're traveling at about 1,000 uh, miles an hour around the sun. And our whole solar system is orbiting through the Milky Way galaxy at the rate of a half a million miles an hour. And the Milky Way galaxy is speeding at nearly a million miles an hour towards some point in interstellar space known as the Great Attractor. And everything attracted to the Great Attractor is traveling at the rate of 800,000 miles an hour toward another supercluster of galaxies called the Shapely Attractor. <laughs> and you don't even have to hold on. You would think you would, but there's this mysterious force of gravity holding you to the Earth. You can open your eyes on the earth. People rarely acknowledge their identity as earthling. But we, we are not only on the earth, we're made of the earth. If you uh, rub your lower and upper teeth together a little bit, you feel the hardness of the bone there. You sense that big bone of skull there behind, holding your brain there? Bones. Bones are phosphate, calcium, heavy metals, all found in, in the earth. Basically, the clay of earth, the skeleton is made of the clay of earth, molded into your shape. Where else could your body have come from? You are earth, walking on earth. Most of your body is liquid, 70 to 80 percent, and much of that liquid has the chemical consistency of the oceans. We literally sweat and cry seawater. We're like earth sprouts that gained a lot of mobility somehow, mysteriously. We're not just on the earth, we're of the earth. Earthlings. And everything we see, the reality we perceive, is just because we have particular kinds of perceivers. 
particular sense organs. And it could be, and in fact it is, on some levels, completely different than what we see. If we could see with electron microscope glasses, for instance, for instance we would just see patterns of energy. Because really, down at the bottom, it's all the same stuff they've discovered, you know? Uh, and the universe is really a trickster on some level. Everything we perceive is made of atoms. And atoms are 99.999% empty space. You take the nucleus of an atom, blow it up millions of times till it's the size of a pea. The electron going around the nucleus will be the size of a dust moat, and it'll be a half a mile away. There's hardly any matter to matter. I read that if that all the matter of all the humans on the planet, if it was all condensed, we would be the size of a sugar cube. <laughs> Not much stuff here to worry about, is there? <laughs> is that amazing? So if your body's made of atoms, and atoms are mostly empty space, what is holding your clothes on? Not only does the emperor have no clothes, the clothes hardly have any emperor. <laughs> We're like an optical illusion. As it says in the uh, Heart Sutra, you know, form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. And on the level of atomic physics, it's absolutely the case. Of course, now they've broken it down, you know, to quarks, leptons, and gluons as the basic uh, particles of all reality. They say everything in the universe, the known universe, is made out of quarks, leptons, and gluons and the forces that act between them. So why does it look like there's so many different things? It's just quarks, leptons, and gluons, quarks, leptons, and gluons. I don't know how it works, but I, I think the gluons hold the quarks and the leptons together. <laughs> That's, that's how it sounds, right? The gluons. <laughs> I, just find, I just find this so interesting. It just, it shatters my ordinary perception, just like meditation does. And... Uh, I think it's so rich to, be, to do that to yourself, for yourself, excuse me. They're now, of course, looking for the theory of everything that's going to tie all these strange uh, conceptions of matter and energy. And, and uh, the superstring theory is the current one. They say everything is actually made out of these minuscule vibrating strings of energy. It's all energy, basically. These strings, the physicists will, will tell you, are so small that the size of a superstring is to a human being as the size of a human being is to the rest of the universe. It's on what they call a Planck scale. And so, of course, nobody's ever seen a st superstring or ever will. But there you go. It's all superstrings. And the superstring theory also uh, posits there are 11 dimensions to reality. There are seven more dimensions to reality that didn't unfold in our universe. When I heard that, it got me re thinking about the fact that we live in a particular configuration of reality. And, and we live in four dimensions, height, width, depth, and time, and that that could be arbitrary, that there could be other dimensions, that, you know, cracks in reality that we can't perceive and, of course, can't manipulate or quite understand. I think it's probably good that we only got four dimensions, because we can barely handle them. <laughs> uh, if there were seven more dimensions, Think of how hard it would be to find your car keys. <laughs> how much harder or... 
there would be all these other cracks in reality. I think that one of the dimensions is where birds go to die. They found a way into that dimension, you know, and so you never see them. And there's a whole dimension just full of feathers and, <laughs> and bird skeletons. I love to make him I love to make him laugh. It's just so much fun. So the physicists are telling us also that consciousness plays a part in creating reality which mystics have known for for centuries. Uh, now the physicists say that the, the Copenhagen in <laughs> the Copenhagen interpretation <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a few more yocto seconds. <laughs> And the, the thing is, you know, that he's heard these jokes before. <laughs> Go figure. As I was saying, <laughs> consciousness plays a part in, in creating reality. Uh, the Copenhagen which interpretation of quantum physics, which is one of the most widely accepted understandings, says, and I quote, there is no reality in the absence of observation. And the way they explain it is that when we're looking, things kind of drop into particle reality as we, we perceive it. And when we aren't looking, there are just waves, probability waves. Um, Einstein could never believe that, that when, when nobody was looking, the moon would, you know, would disappear. We can actually do our own experiment with this. Everybody look over to this side of the room. <laughs> Even you. Well, look, look over there, everybody look over there. Okay, now, presumably the other side of the room has disappeared. <laughs> okay, let's... See, now, either it reassembled itself, or somebody was peeking. <laughs> there, is a, there is a legend... <laughs> There's a legend, maybe apocryphal, that, uh, that there are llamas in caves in the Himalayas holding the world together by paying attention, just in case, you know, at some moment everybody is busy, <laughs> yeah, that, that the world will be held together because they know we have to go through the karma of this life, so they're doing it for us. But really, what, what, what is... The bottom line of what is being understood in physics is that everything is in process. There is no thingness. You might call it uh, the discovery of anatta at, a, at, at the level of subatomic reality because it's all light. Uh, one physicist, uh, physicist says uh, matter is just gravitationally trapped light. It's just a light show. 
Sokni Rinpoche, when he was here, used to ta say, you know, you Westerners, you have, you have a real problem. You think everything is so real. That's your real problem. <laughs> when actually everything is just effervescent. And it's interesting because in, you know, there is this knowledge that we are gaining through the scientific revolution. And the beauty of combining it with the Dharma is that we can actually turn it into wisdom. And my first teacher, Goenka, John and I sat together and you'd sweep, we'd sweep our body, you know, for days and days and hours and hours. And pretty soon it, there was no solidity there. You could feel it was... It, there was, it was just, it was just ever changing, you know. You, it felt like it was almost on a cellular level you could understand a Nietzsche. And when we see it that close and that personally, that this too is in that process, then it becomes embodied, it becomes wisdom rather than just knowledge. Jack Kerouac wrote, happiness consists in seeing everything as a great strange dream. Okay, let's assume uh, for a little bit that the world is real, relatively real, then the fact of our existence. Let's look at that a little bit. Also a cause for wonder. Uh, according to most of the calculations of physicists and astronomers and uh, mathematicians, the odds against you happening are literally astronomical. Uh, if the size of the proton or the size of the electron have been just fraction, fraction, fraction of a degree, bigger or smaller, the nuclear force holding atoms together or the electromagnetic force trying to pull them apart had been just the slightest bit weaker or stronger. Everything would have flown apart or collapsed and then there would be no heavy elements would have been created, no carbon, no oxygen, no, you know. Where would you be then? Oxygen, breathing, life forms, carbon-based life forms, it all happened because of such precise uh, events. It's just particular causes and conditions, uncountable numbers of them, to lead to your existence at this moment. And then your body as I mentioned earlier, made of heavy elements, the earth. Thich Nhat Hanh says, once I was a cloud, once I was a rock. This is not poetry. This is science. This is not, the story. This is not a belief in reincarnation. This is the story of evolution. As far as we know, life, as we know it, is pretty rare, at least in our neighborhood of the Milky Way. Eight other planets spun out of the same cloud of gases as we did, as the Earth did. Doesn't seem to be any sign of life there. We live on a planet that's just the right distance from its sun, just a little closer. It'd be way too hot, or we'd all be at the poles, you know, uh, or living underground. Or a little bit further away, we'd all be huddled around the equator, or maybe we'd all have heavy coats of fur still. This whole global warming crisis, as horrific as it is, it reminds us, perhaps, that just now we're living in a interglacial period where we have enough warmth to grow, enough food to support six billion of us, and have 
extra time and energy left over to create civilization and meditate. <laughs> this is a rare moment. The rarity of life. Something, it seems like something's going on here that, you know, I, I'm afraid to say intelligent, but because, you know, it's a, such a di difficult and dichotomy now between believing in random chance or a creator, or an intelligent designer. And yet, even the, even the most serious scientists are awed by what has happened and will express that awe and say, you know, something, maybe something going on here that we don't understand. And it's not the domain of science to try to understand it. James Lovelock, uh, who came up with the Gaia hypothesis, says the chemical and the climate and chemical properties of the Earth now and throughout its history seem always to have been optimal for life. For this to have happened by chance, is, a, an unlikely, is as unlikely as to survive unscathed driving blindfold through rush hour traffic. The great biologist E.O. Wilson has a wonderful image of, of, he invites you to take a walk to, to grasp the uh, rarity of life. Take a walk from the core of the earth, the center of the earth, out to the surface, and you walk for a month or so through molten rock and then through mountains of hardened rock and then like 10 minutes before you're done with your walk you start to see little pieces of, of matter that move themselves around and little uh, microbes and bacteria and beetles in the underground uh, water table and then suddenly you burst through the surface and there are millions of different species everywhere you look in every nook and cranny there is life uh, with all sorts of different camouflage and means of locomotion and different means of perception and ways of surviving everywhere. And then another five minutes and it's all gone. And as far as we know, this is the only place in the whole universe where this ex exists or this occurs. And, of course, we've been shaped by nature. It's the demands of the ever-changing environment that have led us to be shaped like this, to have developed this brain, these sense organs, this upright stance. You know, for two and a half billion years of life on this planet, there were no legs or feet because there was no land. Nature's like an artist, and we are the art. She's carving us out of this ever-changing flow of shapes, slowly. Richard Dawkins, another very serious, very serious scientist. My overwhelming reaction to the story of evolution is one of amazement. The universe could so easily have remained lifeless and simple. Just physics and chemistry, just the scattered dust of the cosmic explosion that gave birth to time and space. The fact that it did not, the fact that life evolved out of nearly nothing, some 10 billion years after the universe evolved out of literally nothing, is a fact so staggering that I would be mad to attempt words to convey it properly. And even that is not the end of the matter. Not only is life on this planet amazing and deeply satisfying to all whose senses have not become dulled by familiarity, the very fact that we have evolved the brain power to understand our evolutionary genesis redoubles the amazement and compounds the satisfaction. That we can even understand our origins. And what a, what a Dharma lesson to understand our origins. That we've been shaped by all the life that came before us for all the billions of years of li life on this planet. 
it's, it sort of says that, you know, you're emerging out of this mixture of elements and forces and evolving protoplasm and you, you didn't, you're not your fault. Really. And you're just waking up. How exciting that is. The Buddha said, this body is not mine or anyone else's. It has arisen due to causes and conditions. It's almost as if he knew Darwin or understood what Darwin was talking about. Of course, it was in the language and then in the uh, context of his universe of discourse. When we see ourselves in the story of evolution, we realize that life, this life, is a temporary appearance arising as the result of all these different elements coming together, the flow of cosmic and biological evolution. And as the Buddha said, all compounded things will come apart. They have no lasting self. So we have a few minutes left. So I just want to offer you a couple of brief reflections on this body that you are inhabiting and these senses that you use to perceive the world. Uh, I, w I want you to just put your hand on your gut there. You kind of feel the liquid nature of it. And you know that uh, inside of your stomach right now, there are more individual living beings than all the humans that have ever lived on planet Earth. <laughs> Literally, billions and billions of them. And uh, they live on you, and you depend on them. They have uh, little houses and churches in there, I think, and, <laughs> and roads, whole civilizations. <laughs> but really, as, uh, as the Mar Lynn Margulis, one of the great molecular biologists of our time, say, says, you know, our concept of the individual is purely arbitrary. Each of us is a walking ecosystem. Each of us is a community unto ourselves. And then, when we, when we think about our senses, right now, there's silence in the outside world. There's no sound in the outside world, ever. There's only disturbances of the air. All of what we call sound is created inside of your head. Right now I'm flapping my lips and my tongue, creating these disturbance of, disturbances of air that then come and hit the drum of your ear, which then wiggles three little bones, which then disturbs a little pool of liquid, which then moves some little hairs that excite some electrical signals that go to the auditory center of the brain and create what we call sound. And of course, instant meaning as well, I hope, right now, <laughs> plucks it right out of the air. It's like this fantastic Rube Goldberg sound system that allows you to perceive events at a distance, the disturbing uh, uh, disturbances in the air by the, this device. And then you create the sound in your head. Phenomenal. So taken for granted. The eyes. When you look around, you're looking at the most fantastic painting by the greatest artist that ever lived, a continually changing three-dimensional color painting of reality, all taken, all done by the brush and the genius of your eyes and the visual cortex of your brain.
First of all, there's no color in nature. The pigments are all added by the cones and rods in your eyes. The streams of pho photons are just hitting the, the lens of your eyes, which it contains millions, many millions of cells, which then turn those streams of photons into electrical signals. Not a picture, electrical signals that go back to the visual cortex of the brain, which then goes on a little conference call to the other parts of the brain and says, hey, what do we need to know? Not, what do we need to see right now? What, what's, what's important and how should, we, uh, how should we look at this? And, you know, everybody answers back and then the picture is painted and you get flashes of reality, moment after moment after moment, all painted by your eyes and brain. This picture. Move over. Well, it's not exactly a Picasso that I'm seeing, I guess. It's more of a uh, Renoir. Hmm? Hopper. hopper, yes, that's what it is. It's a hopper. <laughs> Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher, the various qualities of the world are purely the creation of the mind. Nature always gets credit, which should in truth be reserved for ourselves. The rose gets credit for its scent, the nightingale for its song, and the sun for its radiance. But the poets are mistaken. They should address their lyrics to themselves. All your dreams of being artists are fulfilled. You don't have to practice the piano. It's just pay attention to your own sight, sound. Uh, Anna last night uh, talked a little bit about uh, the scientists discovering that there's no, the brain, I mean, we, I haven't gotten to the brain and there's really no time for the brain. Uh, <laughs> just except to mention that it processes 11 million bits of information a second, approximately. Uh, approximately. <laughs> uh, a phenomenal organ processes all this information from inside of you, regulating your temperature and your, you know, your hunger and your creating new cells. Millions of new cells are being born every minute and, you know, and then it's processing all this information from the outside world. And it does so without you hardly having to make any effort at all. It just does it. One of the wonders, one of, one of the things I love to do is sit in meditation and not intentionally do ever, anything and everything happens. Everything gets taken care of. And uh, as, as Anna talked about last night, they, find, they, don't find, they can't find the director. Nobody's home. The brain is this amazing self-organizing system, and, and it just does all these things without any direction, it seems. Um, it's uh, been built so well. So the mystery, so much mystery, so much wonder. And when we are present for it, when we are in beginner's mind, it can just fill us with such a kind of gratitude and, and uh, delight in our lives and in our meditation practice. Meditation practice prepares us for that kind of experience. You know how it feels sometimes. You know, you walk out of this room when your mind is still and you're kind of, you know, you kind of got it and you walk outside and it's just like, you know, you're stunned into silence. There's no words for it. It's, it's like when you walk into a great cathedral or into a forest or see a, from the mountaintop uh, and suddenly, you know, you're just, you're in the touch with the mystery one of the most beautiful experiences we can have. So be here, wow. You can uh, do your own reflection, you know, you find your own, you know, science, amazing science information or things that sort of uh, shift you into that mode of perceiving. 
that beginner's mind. In the Torah, it says uh, the beginning of wisdom is awe. Rumi says, awe is the balm that will heal our eyes. So, the reflection, and uh, you can take it into your meditation in a, in a kind of koan kind of way of just when you sit, Raising the question, what is this consciousness? What is this thing that knows? What is this pulsing, sensate, vibrating being? How did it happen? Feel your, feel the structure of your body. 500 million years of vertebrate evolution to get you into this shape. Let me close with a poem by Mary Oliver. It is the nature of stone to be satisfied. It is the nature of water to want to be somewhere else. Everywhere we look, the sweet guttural swill of the water tumbling Everywhere we look, the stone basking in the sun or offering itself to the golden lichen. It is our nature not only to see that the world is beautiful, but to stand in the dark under the stars or at noon in the rainfall of light, frenzied, wringing our hands, half mad, saying over and over, what does it mean that the world is beautiful? What does it mean that the world is? The child asks this, and the determined laboring adult asks this, and the carpenter and the scholar ask this, and the fisherman and the teacher, both the rich and poor, and the old and the very old, not yet having figured it out, ask this desperately, standing beside the golden-coated field rock or the tumbling water or under the stars. What does it mean? What does it mean? If you find out, please let me let me know.